Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome. Today we're going to start a playthrough of Nevsky, Teutons and Rus in Collision 1240 to 1242. This is the first game in the Levian campaign series designed by Volko Runke and published by GMT Games. Two player game, we're going to play both the Teutons and the Russians, play both sides and go back and forth. Now we're going to play the summer 1240 scenario. The Teutons are on the offensive. They have stronger forces and more lords. They're going to be trying to take as much Russian territory and destroy as much Russian territory as they can. The question is, can they do enough to get victory? Or will the Russian lords be able to defend their motherland? Let's do a quick overview of the game. So what we're starting, we're looking at right now is Northern Europe in the year 1240. It's summertime and the Teutonic forces are basically going to attack Russia. And let's take a look just at a brief kind of overview of our map. We have a border that runs down the very central portion of the map. Teutonic forces are on the west side, consisting of Danish Estonia in the north, and then Livonia down here to the south of that. The whole eastern part of the map is Novgorodin, Rus, with a city here of Novgorod right in the center of the, the map. Now, the pieces that we can see here are the lords. The black lords are the Teutonic, Teutonic lords. The white lords are the Russian lords. And those are basically the, the pieces, the forces that are going to be moving on the board. At the top of the map is the turn record track, and we're going to be playing this scenario, which is two turns. It's the summer of 1240, and each turn represents roughly 40 days, and each turn consists of a levy phase, which is basically getting ready, and then a campaign phase, which is basically moving around and fighting. So we also can see that we have two lords here. This is Rudolf for the Teutonic forces, and this is Domash for the Russian forces. We're going to be trying to bringing them, we're going to be trying to bring them into the campaign for both sides very early on to increase the strength of each side. We'll, we'll examine these lords and their forces more deeply as we get into the game, but rightly all, all we really need to know right now is that each lord in the map, on the map has a corresponding lord mat, and it's roughly divided up into a couple of parts. The top half of a mat shows the lord's current forces, the bottom half basically has potential resources and resources that they can bring to bear to help them in their campaigns. We also have some characteristics of each lord here. So we can see that the currently active three Teutonic lords, Yaroslav, Hermann, and then Nud and Abel, the Danish lords. Rudolf von Kassel is the one who hasn't been activated yet, so he is sitting off to the side. He's not currently in the scenario. He'll have to be mustered and brought into the scenario in order to become active. But I've put him here because that's probably going to happen pretty quickly. Here's a look at the three Russian lords that are in the scenario. Domash is the one that is not activated yet. He will be brought in very quickly and will want to do that. He's going to come in at Novgorod, right in the center of the map. And one of the big decisions for the, the Russian forces is what to do with him and where to send him. Gavrilo is one of the two currently active lords, and Vladislav is the other. Let's go take a look at the map to kind of see where these lords are, and then talk a little bit about some of the strategy that we might be looking at for each side. Here is our map, and here's the situation in the summer of 1240 in the position of the lords. We can see the three Teutonic lords here in the west. We can see the two Russian lords here. Now, the Teutonic forces are basically going to be on the offensive. They have three lords, and they have some relatively strong forces. And this kind of gives us a little bit of an idea of what we might try as the Teutonic forces. Nud and Abel, the two Danish princes here, have ships. We can potentially have them land at one of these three places. And then they've got a big open heartland here that Vladislav, the Russian lord, is going to have to somehow try to stop them if they get aggressive to come through here. They could potentially ravage and pick up a lot of points and capture these three areas in here. So Nud and Abel, this strategy of sending them aggressively east, could be a potential strategy that could help the Teutonic forces rack up a lot of victory points. And victory points is the determining factor in this game, and we'll see how that works as we go forward in the scenario. Another possibility for the Teutonic forces is to try to get the city of Piskov down here. It's a big city. You can see the defense number here of three. Taking this would pretty much guarantee the Teutons' victory in such a short scenario, but it's going to be a tough nut to crack. They can basically, um, Gavrilo could hole up here and go under siege, and then it doesn't really give the Teutonic forces much time to do that. Another option might be is to use one or two of the Danish, of the Teutonic lords to trap Gavrilo inside Piskov and then use the free lord to basically run around and kind of pillage and ravage the countryside and rack up a lot of victory points. So we've got a number of options here as the Teuton forces that can get them a lot of points. They definitely have the most powerful side at the beginning of the scenario. A lot of opportunities. I feel like in many ways, this is the Teuton Teutonic forces scenario to lose, if you would. 
The Russian forces, on the other hand, one of our questions is going to be, how do we stop whatever the Tutans are trying to do? Up here in the north, we have Vladislav, who we can potentially send this way to try to negate the Danish lords if they come in here. And then we have also Domas, who's going to come here at Novgorod. We have to decide where to send him. The Tutans are coming straight in from the, the west here, trying to get Piskov. He's going to be necessary to probably come down here, but a little bit depends on what the Teutonic forces do. And I think as the Russians, we're going to be looking for kind of mistakes or errors or opportunities where they can strike and try to get some victory points. If they could knock off and wipe out one of the Teutonic lords, that would go a long way towards ensuring them victory. So now let's get into the levy phase where both sides are going to prepare for combat. So the levy phase of the first turn starts with each side picking two of these Arts of War capability cards. And these cards basically have some events and some capabilities on them. We'll talk more about how they work going forward. But in the very first turn, each side draws two cards and uses the bottom half, which contains the capabilities, and decides what to do with them. So let's see what the Teutonic forces get. The first one here they get is Balistadi, which is crossbowmen. And this Lorne's men at arms have archery with minus two to the target's armor. I feel like this is a very strong capability. So let's figure out who we want to give this to. The Balastadi crossbowman is a function of the men at arms. And the men at arms pieces are these two rectangular blocks, these black rectangular blocks. These represent men at arms troops. So it makes sense to give it to Nud and Abel or to Herman. Herman has two of these. Yaroslav only has one contingent of men at arms. And he's not quite as strong as everybody else, so it would make sense to give it to one of two. However, we're going to add the crossbow capability to Herman here because I think he's potentially going to be pretty active in this first summer. And this is a very strong capability. The minus two to the target's armor makes your cross makes these troops quite a bit more deadly. And it also activates them in the archery phase, which gives them a lot more quick punching power. So I think it makes sense to give them to Herman. I think either of these could work, but we're going to give it to Herman. Let's see what our second capability is here. Oh, more crossbows. All right, these were shuffled too. Well, that makes it easy. All right, so we're gonna give the other crossbows to Newton Abel. That, that actually, that could work out pretty well. I was thinking about some other, potentially some other capabilities for Newton Abel, but we'll give him the crossbows right now. That'll work. Let's see what the Russian capabilities are now. All right, so the Russians have their own set of cards here. Let's see what the Russian capability is. Oh, misfortune for the Russians. No capability. Oh, that hurts. So we'll get rid of that one. Let's see what their other one is. Archbisfork of Novogorod. Russian lords. Now this goes to all. So we're going to put this under the bottom of the, the map here. Russian lords have an extra seat at Novgorod and start their command plus one. Okay, so that's going to actually be helpful for Domash if he comes in at Novgorod because he'll have a an extra command capability for that first turn that he comes in. So let's, uh, we'll put this under the board here to let us know that we have this. Let's just slide down here. This is where the, the abilities, the capabilities that go to all lords sit under the bottom of the board here. And you can have as many of those as you have active lords. So right now we have two active Russian lords and only one active global capability. So no problems with the limits for those. So the next two phases in the, uh, the levy portion of the turn, we're actually not going to do anything with. The first is we could pay coin or loot to extend the, the service time of lords, but I'm not going to do that here in the first levy for either side. And there could also be some disbanding of lords that go on, but because the scenario has just started, that doesn't apply as well. So now we're going to go into the fun part of the levy phase, which is the muster phase. And muster is basically where each lord can spend their lordship points to do things like add forces or add transport or add some capabilities to their troops. And so we're going to jump into that now. And it starts with the Teutonic lords first. So let's jump over and take care of their actions. So the Teutonic lords go first and they're going to be able to do as many mustering actions as their lordship rating. We'll start with Yaroslav. He has one action that he can do. Now, if you're not familiar with the game, there's four things that, four actions that can be taken during mustering. One is you can try to bring in another lord that hasn't yet been, yet been activated in the game. In this case, the Teutons can try to bring in Rudolf because he's ready to come in this turn. Um, and we'll probably do that with another lord in a moment. The other thing is you can bring some of your troops that are your vassal troops, which are represented down here. You can recruit them into your forces. The second, the third thing is you can add transportation. So we have a cart right now. We could add a boat or another cart. And then the last thing we could do is to add a capability 
capability. We can look through the call to arms deck and pick any capability that could be applied to this Lord or to our side and add that to our force, basically making our forces stronger. With Yaroslav, we're going to take his vassal here and we're going to levy him, bring him in, and that's going to add two elements of militia. Because Yaroslav isn't very strong and I feel like having a few more troops there could actually be pretty helpful for him. And I don't think we need boats for him. I'm not sure he's going to go that far. And the other lords, we're going to, the other actions we'll leave to some of the other lords. So let's now go to our next lord. So next up is Herman, and his lordship rating is three, so he gets to be a lot more busier and do a lot more things. And the first thing we're going to have him do is to actually add a capability to the Teutonic side. And so we're going to go get the William of Mordena card, and I'm going to show what that is, and we'll talk a little bit, a little bit about this now, and then we'll show it more later. So this is the capability William of Modena, and basically this is, represents the papal, the papal legate being active in the area. And so this is quite powerful. It adds a lot of opportunities and options for the Teutonic player. So we are going to bring him in. He even gets his own little piece. So this is almost kind of like a mini mechanic to itself. The card is quite unique in terms of the capability cards. So uh, uh, Herman's his first action, he's gonna do that. And we're gonna see how that actually is gonna be pretty helpful for us later in this turn as well. For Herman's second action, we're going to have him try to muster Lord Rudolf von Kassel to his seat. He was the other Lord that we saw that was available in the summer. And for that, we have to go check his fealty rating. Rudolf's fealty rating is a five, which basically we need to roll that or less in order to be able to successfully recruit him for one action. So hoping for a five or less for the Teutons to bring Rudolf into the game, we get a two. So Rudolf is now activated. Now, Rudolf can't, in the turn that Rudolf is brought into the active, he can't muster this turn. So he's basically, what we see is what we get for him. But we also gonna put his service marker, which is a two, that's gonna go up onto the board. So if we look at the turn record track, this two indicates how many uh, campaigns, basically, forward we're going to put his service because when this runs out that means we can lose him from the game from our from the Teutonic side so one two so his marker goes there so he's going to be in service probably unless things happen to go sideways for him uh, until the end of this game for Herman's third and final uh, mustering action we're going to have him recruit I have him levy some of his own vassals we're going to take this knight here which is a strong uh, unit for us and then it also adds a men-at-arms, which is good too, because again, Herman has the crossbows and the men-at-arms can fire those deadly crossbows. So this brings him up to a relatively strong military force. And that's Herman's third action. So now let's go to Nude and Abel and see what they're going to do. The first thing that Nude and Abel are going to do here is they're going to add this capability called COGS. And this is basically floating forts. What this does is it says this Lord's ships, and we can see Newton's Abel's um, crest is represented here, so he's one of the lords that can use this. Each serve as two ships, can be shared anywhere, and can weather tempests. Because right now, Newton Abel have two ships, so they can use the oceanic movement. This will give them four ships by adding this capability, which will mean we can carry more stuff and make them a lot more mobile. So we're going to try this capability here because we're thinking, I'm thinking the Teutons can kind of build him as a raider. So we add that capability to the bottom of his mat, and now he can't have any more. He's used all two of his capabilities. However, he still has two mustering actions left to do. Not quite sure how to play this, to be honest. But what we're going to try to do is he's going to muster a boat and a cart here, which I think will add him movement capacity once he has used up his ship movement and is able to start moving along kind of the Russian force, to drive deeper into Russian lands. I think the cart and the boat will give him a lot of flexibility and allow him to move around and raid a little bit more easily. So that's the end of Newton Abel's third lordship action. Each one of the lords has mustered now. Rudolf again can't muster because he's just been brought into the, the scenario this turn. We're going to start with uh, Vladislav mustering. He has two lordship actions. His first one is going to see if he can muster Domash to see if he gets him in the game. Domash's fealty rating is a four, so we need a four or less to be successful. Ah, oh, they fail and get a six. We're going to hold on trying that again for Vladislav. Instead, we're going to have him pick up the fake capability Streltsy, which is the uh, Russian version of crossbowmen, exactly the same as the Balastari for the Teutonic forces. So we're going to add this under Vladislav's mat. This, I think, will make him a lot more powerful because he does have two men-at-arms that will give them a lot more capacity for 
firepower. So now let's go to Gavrilo, the second of the two Russian lords. Gavrilo is going to go now and try to convince Domash to join the war here after Vladislav failed so miserably. Come on, Domash, come on in. He needs a four or less. He gets a four. Excellent. So Domash's cylinder is now in the game. He is at Novrogo uh, Novgorod for when he gets mustered. So we bring him into the game and drop his cylinder on there and his mat is now active. Likewise, he can't muster in this turn. And Gavrilo still has two actions left to do. The first thing we're going to do for him with that one of those two remaining actions is to uh, add this cap capability here called Luchniki, which is massed archers. And it means that this Lord's militia and light horse have archery. Archery fires first, so it's quite powerful, I think, to add this capacity to a Lord's forces. Now, you might be saying, well, wait a second here. He's only got one militia and one um, light cavalry here. These are these brown units here. However, what we can do here now for this is we can add these. We could add the militia here or the militia and light horse. Let's add the militia and light horse. So we're going to both add those in there. So we'll give him more forces. Here we go. So we added the light archers and the men at arms. And so now the light horse, we have four groups and they all have archery. I think this makes Gavrilo quite uh, considerably more powerful. And we've used up his last and final lordship rating. That brings us now to the end of this portion of the levy phase. So now our, our battle map is getting set. We've added in Lord Domash to Novgorod. We've added in Rudolf down here in the very far bottom left corner for the Teutonic forces. Still the Teutonic lords outnumber the Russian lords four to three. But we have now what's called the call to arms phase. And this is the last thing that we do before we shift to the campaign. And this is where this William of Modena card comes in for, to play for the Teutonic forces. He has a bunch of actions that he can perform. And one of the ones that uh, I think is quite powerful, especially in this instance, is he can show up at the seat of a lord. And if the lord is there, that lord can now, he can then be there and influence the lord to use his lordship again. So basically getting an extra muster for this lord. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to have um, uh, William of Modena is going to show up here at uh, Dorpat and he's going to talk to Herman. He's going to say, Herman, get busy, do more stuff. This is a big war. We need you to just be more active. And then he's going to head back to his card, which goes back to the bottom of the board. And he can do that again next turn if Herman happens to still be here. But he probably won't be, right? But for right now, this is good. So Herman, now motivated, is going to use his lordship one more time. With William of Modena uh, encouraging Herman to muster again, Herman gets to take three full lordship actions. We're going to fill his little vacant spot here on his capabilities by adding trebuchets. Now these will give us better chance if we get into a storming a fortress type of situation, which could very well happen with him if he heads down to Piskov down in the central part of Russia. So that's one action. We have two more, and I confess I'm not not having done this before, I'm not quite sure what might be good things to spend this on. But right now, all Herman has is one contingent of boats. So we're going to add a second boat contingent to him. That'll allow him to carry more provender. And then a contingent of carts as well. I think that's going to give him more flexibility and perhaps the ability to get better supply and things like that. So we're going to just see how that works. With that now, we are done with the Teutonic call to arms segment. Let's go do the Russian call to arms segment. The Russians call to arms phase basically isn't so super exciting for this one. Uh, they can spend this victory point that they're given at the start here uh, in a couple of ways to kind of extend the service and do a couple of other things. But none of them make I don't think make any sense right now. And that doesn't really give them an alternative action in this scenario. So they don't really do anything. And now our world is ready for campaigning. We shift from the levy phase to the campaign phase. I flip the turn marker up top from the levy marker to the campaign marker, and it is time for action. The first thing we do in the campaign phase is we set up, we determine our command decks. And this is basically the order in which lords can take actions in the next turn. And in the summertime, there are, each deck consists of six cards. And so some lords can perform actions three times, some lords won't perform any actions at all. And what you do in two player or in single player, now the idea is that 
each side secretly builds their own command deck and kind of hidden from the other side. And then you take turns, Teutons are going to go first, they're going to activate one Lord based on who's in the top card in their command deck, and you go through all six cards, uh, alternating between the two sides. And this is one place where I feel like in solitaire play that kind of breaks down because you lose all that secrecy element. So. We're going to go down to our next video where we start the campaign phase and instead of using kind of the default way to do that in the game, I've been kind of working on a little bit of a modified version for solo play that allows for a little bit more variability, randomness, and yet still a good amount of control over the deck creation process for solitaire play. So to learn more about that, click on the next video that's up here once it's ready. And if you're also uh, ready to continue our story, we're going to use that video both to learn about that method and continue this campaign. See you in the next video. Thanks for watching, everybody.